Book One, Chapters Three and Four of The Wars of the Jews. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wars of the Jews by Josephus. Translated by William Whiston. Book One, Chapters Three and Four. Chapter Three How Aristobulus was the first that put a diadem about his head and after he had put his mother and brother to death, died himself, when he had reigned no more than a year. 1. For after the death of their father, the elder of them, Aristobulus, changed the government into a kingdom, and was the first that put a diadem upon his head, four hundred seventy and one years and three months after our people came down into this country, when they were set free from the Babylonian slavery. Now, of his brethren, he appeared to have an affection for Antigonus, who was next to him, and made him his equal. But for the rest he bound them, and put them in prison. He also put his mother in bonds, for her contesting the government with him, for John had left her to be the governess of public affairs. He also proceeded to that degree of barbarity as to cause her to be pined to death in prison. 2. But vengeance circumvented him in the affair of his brother Antigonus, whom he loved, and whom he made his partner in the kingdom. For he slew him by the means of the calumnies which ill men about the palace contrived against him. At first, indeed, Aristobulus would not believe their reports, partly out of the affection he had for his brother, and partly because he thought that a great part of these tales were owing to the envy of their relators. However, as Antigonus came once in a splendid manner from the army to that festival, wherein our ancient custom is to make tabernacles for God, it happened, in those days, that Aristobulus was sick, and that, at the conclusion of the feast, Antigonus came up to it, with his armed men about him, and this when he was adorned in the finest manner possible, and that, in a great measure, to pray to God on the behalf of his brother. Now at this very time it was that these ill men came to the king, and told him in what a pompous manner the armed men came, and with what insolence Antigonus marched and that such his insolence was too great for a private person, and that accordingly he was come with a great band of men to kill him. For what he could not endure this bare enjoyment of royal honor, when it was in his power to take the kingdom himself. 3. Now Aristobulus, by degrees, and unwillingly, gave credit to these accusations, and accordingly he took care not to discover his suspicion openly, though he provided to be secure against any accidents, so he placed the guards of his body in a certain dark subterranean passage, for he lay sick in a place called formerly the citadel, though afterwards its name was changed to Antonia. And he gave orders that if Antigonus came unarmed, they should let him alone, but if he came to him in his armor, they should kill him. He also sent home to let him know beforehand that he should come unarmed. But, upon this occasion, the queen very cunningly contrived the matter with those that plotted his ruin, for she persuaded those that were sent to conceal the king's message, but to tell Antigonus how his brother had heard he had got a very the suit of armor made with fine martial ornaments, in Galilee, and because his present sickness hindered him from coming and seeing all that finery. He very much desired to see him now in his armor, because, said he, in a little time thou art going away from me. 4. As soon as Antigonus heard this, the good temper of his brother not allowing him to suspect any harm from him, he came along with his armor on, to show it to his brother. But when he was going along that dark passage, which was called Strato's Tower, he was slain by the bodyguards, and became an eminent instance how calumny destroys all good will and natural affection, and how none of our good affections are strong enough to resist envy perpetually. 5. And truly any one would be surprised at Judas upon this occasion, he was of the sect of the Essens, and had never failed or deceived men in his predictions before. Now this man saw Antigonus as he was passing along by the temple, and cried out to his acquaintance, they were not a few who attended upon him as his scholars, O oh, strange, said he, it is good for me to die now, since truth is dead before me, and somewhat that I have foretold hath proved false, for this Antigonus is this day alive, who ought to hare died this day and the place where he ought to be slain, according to that fatal decree, was Strato's tower, which is at the distance of six hundred furlongs from this place. And yet four hours of this day are over already, 
which point of time renders the prediction impossible to be filled. And when the old man had said this, he was dejected in his mind, and so continued. But in a little time news came that Antigonus was slain in a subterraneous passage, which was itself also called Strato's Tower, by the same name with that Caesarea which lay by the seaside, and this ambiguity it was which caused the prophet's disorder. 6. Hereupon Aristobulus repented of the great crime he had been guilty of, and this gave occasion to the increase of his distemper. He also grew worse and worse, and his soul was constantly disturbed at the thoughts of what he had done, till his very bowels being torn to pieces by the intolerable grief he was under, so threw up a great quantity of blood. And as one of those servants that attended him carried out that blood, he, by some supernatural providence, slipped and fell down in the very place where Antigonus had been slain, and so he spilt some of the murderer's blood upon the spots of the blood had been murdered, which still appeared. Hereupon a lamentable cry arose among the spectators, as if the servant had spilled the blood on purpose in that place, and as the king heard that cry, he inquired what was the cause of it, and while nobody durst tell him, he pressed them so much the more to let him know what was the matter. So at length, when he had threatened them, and forced them to speak out, they told. Whereupon he burst into tears and groaned, and said, So I perceive I am not like to escape the all-seeing eye of God as to the great crimes I have committed, but the vengeance of the blood of my kinsmen pursues me hastily. O thou most impudent body, how long wilt thou retain a soul that ought to die on account of the punishment it ought to suffer for a mother and a brother slain? How long shall I myself spend my blood drop by drop? Let them take it all at once, and let their ghosts no longer be disappointed by a few parcels of my bowels offered to them. As soon as he had said these words, he presently died, when he had reigned no longer than a year. Chapter 4. What actions were done by Alexander Janius, who reigned twenty-seven years? 1. And now the king's wife loosed the king's brethren, and made Alexander king, who appeared both elder in age, and more moderate in his temper than the rest, who, when he came to the government, slew one of his brethren, as affecting to govern himself, but had the other of them in great esteem, as loving a quiet life, without meddling with public affairs. 2. Now it happened that there was a battle between him and Ptolemy, who is called Lathyrus, who had taken the city Asochius. He indeed slew a great many of his enemies, but the victory rather inclined to Ptolemy. But when this Ptolemy was pursued by his mother Cleopatra, and retired into Egypt, Alexander besieged Gadara, and took it. He also did Amathus, which was the strongest of all the fortresses that were about Jordan, and therein were the most precious of all the possessions of Theodorus, the son of Zeno. Whereupon Theodopus marched against him, and took what belonged to himself, as well as the king's baggage, and slew ten thousand of the Jews. However, Alexander recovered this blow, and turned his force towards the maritime parts, and took Raphia and Gaza, with Anthedon also, which was afterwards called Agrippius by King Herod. 3. But when he had made slaves of the citizens of all these cities, the nation of the Jews made an insurrection against him at a festival. For at those feasts seditions are generally begun, and it looked as if he should not be able to escape the plot they had laid for him, and not his foreign auxiliaries, the Pisidians and Cilicians, assisted him. For as to the Syrians, he never admitted them among his mercenary troops, on account of their innate enmity against the Jewish nation. And when he had slain more than six thousand of the rebels, he made an incursion into Arabia. And when he had taken that country, together with the Gileadaries and Moabites, he enjoined them to pay him tribute, and returned to Ariathus. And as Theodorus was surprised at his great success, he took the fortress and demolished it. 4. However, when he fought with Obodas, king of the Arabians, who had lain in ambush for him near Golan, and a plot against him, he lost his entire army, which was crowded together in a deep valley, and broken to pieces by the multitude of camels. And when he had made his escape to Jerusalem, he provoked the multitude, which hated him before, to make an insurrection against him, and this on account of the greatness of the calamity that he was under. However, he was then too hard for them, and, in the several battles that were fought on both sides, he slew not fewer than fifty thousand of the Jews in the interval of six years. 
yet he had no reason to rejoice in these victories, since he did but consume his own kingdom, till at length he left off fighting, and endeavored to come to a composition with them, by talking with his subjects. But this mutability and irregularity of his conduct made them hate him still more, and when he asked them why they so hated him, and what he should do in order to appease them, they said, by killing himself. For that it would be then all they could do to be reconciled to him, who had done such tragical things to them, even when he was dead. At the same time they invited Demetrius, who was called Eucerus, to assist them, and as he readily complied with their requests, in hopes of great advantages, and came with his army, the Jews joined with those auxiliaries about Shechem. Yet did Alexander meet both these forces with one thousand horsemen, and eight thousand mercenaries that were on foot. He also had with him that part of the Jews which favored him, to the number of ten thousand, while the adverse party had three thousand horsemen, and fourteen thousand footmen. Now, before they joined battle, the kings made proclamation, and endeavored to draw off each other's soldiers, and make them revolt. While Demetrius hoped to induce Alexander's mercenaries to leave him, and Alexander hoped to induce the Jews that were with Demetrius to leave him. But since neither the Jews would leave off their rage, nor the Greeks prove unfaithful, they came to an engagement, and to a close fight with their weapons, in which battle Demetrius was the conqueror, although Alexander's mercenaries showed the greatest exploits, both in soul and body. Yet did the upshot of this battle prove different from what was expected, as to both of them, for neither did those that invited Demetrius to come to them continue firm to him, though he was conqueror, and six thousand Jews, out of pity to the change of Alexander's condition, when he was fled to the mountains, came over to him. Yet could not Demetrius bear this turn of affairs, but supposing that Alexander was already become a match for him again, and that all the nation would at length run to him, he left the country and went his way. However, the rest of the Jewish multitude did not lay aside their quarrels with him when the foreign auxiliaries were gone, but they had a perpetual war with Alexander, until he had slain the greatest part of them, and driven the rest into the city Bernasilis. And when he had demolished that city, he carried the captives to Jerusalem. Nay, his rage was grown so extravagant, that his barbarity proceeded to the degree of impiety. For when he had ordered eight hundred to be hung upon crosses in the midst of the city, he had the throats of their wives and children cut before their eyes, and these executions he saw as he was drinking and lying down with his concubines, upon which so deep a surprise seized on the people, that eight thousand of his opposers fled away the very next night, out of all Judea, whose flight was only terminated by Alexander's death. So at last, though not till late, and with great difficulty, he, by such actions, procured quiet to his kingdom, and left off fighting any more. 7. Yet did that Antiochus, who is also called Dionysius, became an origin of troubles again. This man was the brother of Demetrius, and the last of the race of the Seleucidae. Footnote. Josephus here calls this Antiochus the last of the Seleucidae. Although there remained still a shadow of another king of that family, Antiochus Asiaticus, or Comagenus, who reigned, or rather lay hid, till Pompey quite turned him out, as Dean Aldridge here notes from Appian and Justin. End footnote. Alexander was afraid of him, when he was marching against the Arabians, so he cut a deep trench between Antipatris, which was near the mountains, and the shores of Joppa. He also erected a high wall before the trench, and built wooden towers, in order to hinder any sudden approaches. But still he was not able to exclude Antiochus, for he burnt the towers, and filled up the trenches, and marched on with his army. And as he looked upon taking his revenge on Alexander, for endeavoring to stop him, as a thing of less consequence, he marched directly against the Arabians, whose king retired into such parts of the country as were fittest for engaging the enemy, and then on the sudden made his horse turn back, which were in number ten thousand, and fell upon Antiochus's army while they were in disorder, and a terrible battle ensued. Antiochus's troops, so long as he was alive, fought it out, although a mighty slaughter was made among them by the Arabians. But when he fell, for he was in the forefront, in the utmost danger, in rallying his troops, they all gave ground, and the greatest part of his army were destroyed, either in the action or the flight. And for the rest, who fled to the village of Cana, it happened that they were all consumed by want of necessaries, a few only excepted. 8. About this time it was that the people of Damascus, out of their hatred to Ptolemy, 
the son of Menhens, invited Aretas to take the government, and made him king of Celesyria. This man also made an expedition against Judea, and beat Alexander in battle, but afterwards retired by mutual agreement. But Alexander, when he had taken Pella, marched to Gerasa again, out of his covetous desire he had of Theodorus's possessions. And when he had built a triple wall about the garrison, he took the place by force. He also demolished Golan, and Seleucia, and what was called the Valley of Antiochus. Besides which, he took the strong fortress of Gamala, and stripped Demetrius, who was governor therein, of what he had, on account of the many crimes laid to his charge, and then returned into Judea, after he had been there three whole years in this expedition. And now he was kindly received of the nation, because of the good success he had. So when he was at rest from war, he fell into distemper, for he was afflicted with a court and ague, and supposed that, by exercising himself again in martial affairs, he should get rid of this distemper, but by making such expeditions at unseasonable times, and forcing his body to undergo greater hardships than it was able to bear, he brought himself to his end. He died, therefore, in the midst of his troubles, after he had reigned seven and twenty years. End of Book 1, Chapters 3 and 4